Well, everybody, what's the crack? And welcome back to episode number 34 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, Gareth Houston. And we're back to another solo episode. We've had some superstar guests on recently. But today, it's back to just you and me. And with Superstar Guest brings a whole new listenership and new audiences. So if this is your first solo episode of the NNG podcast, welcome. Come on in. The water is lovely. Now, we've also got some big guests coming up in future weeks. But those episodes not only take longer to edit, but also take time to go out because I need the approval of the guest. So all the episodes are fully edited and sent out to the guests for their approval. They can tell me if they want stuff deleted or changed and then they go out. So these people have very busy schedules and it can take a little while. So while I'm waiting on them, I thought I'd do a filler episode. And initially I'd plan like a generic filler episode in my head. You know the way like sitcoms will do like uh, five minutes of brand new content and then the rest of the show will be clips and reminiscing. I was going to do that, but actually that's more work than doing a new episode. Because my editing team are fucking idiots. I'm the editing team. So today I'm actually going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to take a U-turn and we're actually going to do quite a hard-hitting, serious episode. So first, a warning. If you're looking for a light-hearted, happy-go-lucky episode, this one might not be for you. Uh, go check out another episode of the NIG podcast or perhaps go check out another podcast if that's what you're looking for. For example, I would recommend The Flute NI, Ashton Agnew's podcast on Spotify. There's one episode in particular with a particularly charming Belfast man. But today's episode will be talking on some potentially upsetting themes, including various types of abuse. So if you're not in the right headspace for that, jump out now, go find another one. So this week we are going to be taking a look at toxic masculinity in both the classical music and flute worlds. As if you need another white lad, another straight white lad talking about that on the internet. So what we'll do first is we will clear up our definitions on what that term actually means. It's very important to get these things right. Then I'm going to chat a little bit about my own observations and experiences with this. We'll then talk about how toxic masculinity can lead to abuse before moving on to some examples of that in the classical music and flute worlds. Then we're going to chat some potential antidotes to toxic masculinity and what you and I can do to bring this music industry and the flute industry into the modern world. So the final disclaimer before we start. I am not a mental health health expert. I have never studied mental health or psychology or anything along those lines. At the end of this podcast, there will be some resources read out from genuine professionals. So if you want to dig deeper or get any help, I'd recommend going there and that will also be in the description. Also, important to know, I will not be naming any names of anyone in this podcast that is not already published in a reputable news source. I will not be giving out any new information that you cannot find anywhere else on the internet easily. These are well-known things. Other than that, I will not be releasing any other information, mainly because I can't afford a lawsuit. So let's get in and about it. What is toxic masculinity? Well, these days it's a little bit of a buzzword. So I'm I think a lot of people have varying ideas of what toxic masculinity as a term actually means. So I'm going to give you my definition of what I think it means. And we'll proceed with that definition for the sake of this podcast. So firstly, let's take the toxic out of it and let's look at what masculinity is on its own. Because I'm a stickler for details. Masculinity, also called manhood or manliness, is a set of attributes, behaviours and roles associated with men and boys. Now, there's a lot of debate going on around whether masculinity is socially constructed or rooted in biology or indeed a mixture of the two. I.e. the nature versus nurture argument. I don't know anywhere near about enough about that to really comment on it. I'm not a scientist, if that wasn't clear. But I do imagine, like most things, it lies somewhere in the grey area between the two. But anyway, what are some examples of masculine traits? Now, what we assume to be masculine traits, and for the sake of this episode, I am referring purely to the modern Western world's idea of masculinity. Because it does change vastly across different countries and different cultures. Now, masculine traits. Generally, we're talking things like... Physical strength, courage, independence, leadership, assertiveness. These are things that are perceived to be masculine. I'm not saying they're masculine. I'm saying this is the perception. And a lot of these things come from hunter-gatherer times, you know, thousands of years ago. But we're well past those days now, lads. Now, you're probably thinking, Gareth, none of those traits you just mentioned are particularly toxic. And you'd be right. These aren't necessarily toxic traits. To be toxic 
by the way, the definition of toxic is harmful or unpleasant in a pervasive way. These traits need to evolve a bit. Sorry, I've got to do that once when I do the whole toxic thing, but I can't keep saying toxic and not have that in my head. Anyway, so as these traits become more pronounced, they fall into two categories, healthy masculinity and toxic masculinity. So some examples of toxic masculinity include unconditional physical toughness, physical aggression, fear of emotions, discrimination against people that aren't heterosexual, hyper-independence, sexual aggression or violence, and misogynistic behavior. Examples of healthy masculinity, however, are to address disrespect, to encourage men to express emotions freely, encourage compassion and kindness towards themselves and others, to listen to experiences and validate feelings, and to check in with male friends and loved ones. Now, the healthy traits have superb outcomes. They, men will tend to have a healthy or balanced sense of masculinity. Men who are more content, men, blah, 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 sorry. Men who are more connected with their emotions will experience increased life satisfaction and self-esteem and decreased rates of mental health problems such as anxiety and depression. So healthy masculinity is, as it says on the tin, very healthy. I can't remember the source for that, but if you want to know where I got all this information, let me know. There's a few different sources. Like, who do you think I am? I'm not Brian Cox, all right? I'm not a scientist. I know this is a very low-budget podcast. Um, but the toxic traits also have outcomes. That will lead itself to aggression, sexism, trauma, academic challenges, chauvinism, and probably the biggest one or the most talked about one would be abusive behavior. Now, I'm going to get into that in a second, but I'm going to take a very short break to plug the Patreon before I go on here because I don't want that getting in the middle of the the particularly difficult topics that are coming up. So I want to get this out of the way now. So, Patreon. You can support this podcast. You can go to patreon.com forward slash the inline G flute podcast. The link is in the description and it should be appearing up on your screens now. How does it work? You sign up to the Patreon for five quid a month. That's five euros, five dollars or five pounds a month. You sign up, you donate to it. You will not get any extra episodes. I know, that is shocking. What you will get from it is the occasional live episode. You'll get to ask guests in advance some questions and submit them to them. But essentially what you're doing is supporting the podcast. This podcast is fully independent. I do everything around here from graphic design, marketing, promotion, audio production, video production, every aspect of this podcast is done by me. I love it. It's one of the great pleasures of my life doing this podcast. But small donations of a couple of quid, especially in the Patreon with a recurring monthly thing, really helps me push this podcast on. It allows me to turn down some work when I need to, to concentrate more time in the podcast. And it also covers things like travel costs when we want to go and get the real superstar guests face to face. So if you can afford to donate five quid a month to the podcast, go sign up to the Patreon. You can jump up and jump out, sorry, whenever you want. If you sign up now and you decide next month you don't want to sign up anymore, you hit unsubscribe and you're out instantly. There's no fucking around in Patreon. Um, if you can afford it, it is incredibly appreciated. And if you can't afford it, you're paying for someone else who can't afford it to listen to this podcast. If you cannot afford it, that's fine. You can listen for free. Thank you very much, guys. Now back into this. Before we go analysing abuse, I'm going to take a look at some examples of toxic masculinity before abuse in the classical music world. So the subject for this week, the subject person or the subject matter, is myself. Now I actually feel quite blessed in many ways with my experiences in classical music. I started learning at home almost uniquely with family members and flute bands until I left Belfast at the age of 18. When I went to Cardiff, my teacher, my flute teacher was a man, but a prime example of a man showing healthy masculinity. Roger was caring, he was kind, he was open about emotion, supportive, never showed aggression or anger or any assertiveness or anything like that. Now that comes from me as a lad, so I know my experiences as a fella can be a little bit skewed or biased, but I will say that everyone I knew in his class, which was mainly girls, have told me the same thing. They've had an identical experience. Now, I'm not saying he's perfect, but what I'm saying is I can see that it all looks very good from here. So I feel myself very lucky to have studied with someone like Roger Armstrong. Um, Anyone from the Team Rods Club who are listening, you'll understand. We're all big fans. So, and then after that, I went to Paris to do my master's and I had only female teachers for every single class. 
So it was only after Paris, when I was kind of out in the real music world, post-studies, that I started to see toxic masculinity show itself up. Now for me, personally, it's always the same story. I get male musicians, especially older lads, particularly feel attracted or attached to me because I'm straight, I love beer, and I love football. So these days, as we all know, these traits are becoming less, increasingly less common in the arts. Thank fuck. So they all, these lads always gravitate to me. If you go to a music college these days or any kind of liberal arts college, obviously we have more women, more LGBTQ plus, BTQ plus um, members. It's becoming a much more diverse place. So the old boys club of straight, white lads, beer, football, it's going down. Thank God. It should be more refl- reflective of society. Sorry. So anyway... These lads always gravitated towards me, especially the older lads who remember it like it was in their days. And I'm always invited to the pub. That's the, that's the big one. Now, it's not for shared interests, however. I have to make that really clear. It's almost always to allow them to express their toxic traits and reinforce the belief that they're good for finding out someone else who seems like them. So, what I mean is, to be first of all, to be clear, I love going to the pub. I fucking love going to the pub. Or I love going to a football match with the lads. It's one of the great pleasures in my life. You should see my face when I get to go to the pub or get to go to a football match. I love it. But I'll give you an example. Once I went to a pub here in Germany with a musician that I met at a party. Uh, we met at a party. He heard my accent, you know, being Belfast. And we got chatting, you know, as you do in English. And then we both discovered we liked football. We both supported the same team, etc., etc. So we were like, oh, do you want to meet up for the match this Sunday? And we'll watch it in the pub. Great. So I'm sitting in the pub, ordering myself a lovely pint of Guinness. I'm getting ready for Chelsea to get fucking spanked as usual. And as I'm sitting there, he walks in. The very, very first thing he says to me, before hello or how's it going or anything like that, he sits down beside me and he goes, sorry I'm late, but she's on the blob. Now for anyone who doesn't understand that, that's British slang or I think it's American as well. She is on the blob means he's referring to his girlfriend who had her period at the time. So, and he made some comment about her being crazy and them having an argument. Now, when you say things like that to me, read the room. That's the wrong crowd. I'm not that, I'm not that dude, okay? So, here's my theory. I think these lads are very out of touch with the world. They have no other mates, really, to do this with, to go to the pub with, to watch football. And so, they jump on it when I come along. They don't go to actual normal pubs because, let's be honest, classical musicians tend to be fucking weirdos a lot of the time. So when they do go to a pub, they have this image, this romanticized image of a pub or masculinity from like the 1980s. They have this image of like going to a pub and all the lads are smoking and there's no women and they're all complaining about their wives and their girlfriends. Uh, like essentially a place to be openly sexist or homophobic, which is what pubs probably were in the 70s or 80s. But they're not anymore. And especially not in a city like Cologne. For anyone who doesn't know... Cologne is not only the gay capital of Germany, but one of the most liberal cities in the entire city. It's very left-wing, very diverse, very open-minded. There's nowhere more open, apart from certain parts of Berlin, than Cologne. So you're really reading the room wrong there. And I think these lads just, they've never really experienced masculinity. They come with me and they think they're going to get that experience and they jump on it. But it's very disorientating to have someone refer to his girlfriend in that way. When I've met the girl briefly... And you're giving me way too much information about her. And also, you're showing a total disrespect to someone who's suffering quite a lot. You can tell everything you need to know about a person. When I say I want to go to the pub and have a pint and watch football, that's what I want. That is what I want. I love it, man. I love going to the pub and watching football. But I mean, I want to watch football. Two weeks ago, I was at a pub um, and a fella I know, shout out Tim if he's listening, uh, he is a journalist for... Football. He's a football journalist in Germany, essentially. And a couple of mates over from London. We got in. He was like, oh, you know, Gareth loves football. These lads love football. I swear to God, we sat in this Irish pub at 3 o'clock in the morning. We're the only ones left. And the whole last two hours, we were naming the Champions League lineups of every single final from 2012. So we go, 2012, Champions League final, Chelsea, Bayern Munich. Who was in goal for Chelsea? Ah, what well, was was Petr Cech, wasn't it? And then at right back, it was... Oh, actually, I kind of forgot that. No, it wasn't it Basingua at right back, Cahill... David Luiz in the centre, Ashley Gola left back, Ryan Bergfriend. Anyway, we did that for every single team. No Googling for two hours straight, covering 11 years worth of Champions League finals. And I loved it. That is my idea of heaven. That's what I want. Lads in the pub just doing this. But this is a small example of what me, as a straight white lad 
experience with regards to toxic masculinity. So I'm very protected generally. But these traits develop far further, these toxic masculinity traits. So toxic masculinity, unfortunately, often and can quite easily turn into abuse. So I've got a quote here for you guys. Studies indicate that for many men, sexual harassment may in fact be reinforced by the indications of suffering that it produces in its victims, particularly in women said to threaten men's masculine identity by directly challenging, directly challenging the legitimacy of extant Extant, sorry, extant gender discrimination by behaving in manners normally characterized as masculine or simply by working in traditionally male-dominated fields or capacities. So in other words, these men feel intimidated by the women, they harass them to re-establish dominance and they that they feel entitled to have naturally just by being lads. Classic misogyny, sexism. Now, this could be established or you could get this dominance, you could establish this dominance through psychological abuse, physical abuse or sexual abuse, which is one of the most high profile topics, especially in the classical music world. So abuse in classical music is my next topic. Uh, we've all seen the recent high profile cases, I think. You know, James Levine, the conductor at the Met Opera in New York, he got done. Nine different men came out accusing him of things. Prick. Uh, Charles Dutois. We all know what happened to him, the other conductor. I've this is one of the few times you'll let me you'll hear me mention these lads' names in this podcast. I'm very anti mentioning these lads' names, but for this one I will. So Charles Dutois was accused by very many women. Also lost a lot of jobs. Placido Domingo. We all kind of forgot about that one, didn't we? He's back fucking gigging. He's running about now. Do you know how many women accused him of sexual abuse? Twenty seven. Twenty seven fucking women. There's been no trial and he's running about there gigging away. Classical music man. Like in any other industry, especially since the Me Too movement, you'd be fucked out. But the nature of classical music, especially classical music tuition, where it's one to one, you idolize these people, a lot of power rests with them, combined with the amount of power top conductors and soloists have, not just with wealth, but also control over other people's careers. Because it's an art after all. So it's very subjective how you get your careers. Um, and subjectivity is the name of the game. This all lends itself particularly to abusive situations. So, uh, I've got another thing here. Yeah, Deborah Annett, who is Chief Executive of the Independent Society of Musicians, or the ISM, you might know them as, compiled the Dignity in Music report in 2022 from a survey of 660 UK members. She said there is widespread fear amongst freelance musicians who rely on others to keep working. Now, she quotes here, There are people with little black books, the fixers who book you. If you don't keep squeaky clean, which means not making a complaint, you won't get work. It's as simple as that. You can't rock the boat. She then added, the music sector is the wild west. There are lots of informal structures. Are you available? Who do you know? There aren't the HR processes of a standard workplace. If you, if you make a complaint, you won't get booked again. These people are like 19th century gang masters. They decide who works. And that is so true. The classical music world is not up to date with this. There is no centralized place for human resources to make complaints to. All the power lies with individuals. And a lot of these individuals tend to be lads. Now, the flute world itself has had some pretty big scandals. In one of the earlier podcast episodes, I think episode six, Music College Culture, I commented on an article by Hattie Butterworth that she wrote for the Evening Standard last year. Uh, about is classical music teacher teaching broken and I did cover and a particularly abusive flute teacher in there so you can go check that out but some other high profile cases Bradley Garner I'm sure we've all heard about this and we all heard this one this happened in 2016 he was sacked from New York University for some very serious and strong claims made against him Claims such as unwanted advances, forcefully grabbing and kissing young students during lessons, even recording them in the bedroom and showing people against their knowledge. Brad Garner, by the way, was named on a jury last year at the International Doppler Festival in or Doppler competition in the Phil in the Philippines, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. And that would have given him unmonitored contact with young performers. Fucking brilliant. Thank fuck he was pulled away after a lot of social media uproar against it. But what the fuck would even make you think of booking him? Like, what part of your brain even thinks that's acceptable to do after the litany of claims that came out, came out, Scott, came out against him? Sorry. Now, I can say his name. I can say Brad Garner because all these are published sources. You can go and Google that name. It's all been published all over the place. So 
It's not me that's making these claims. I'm just quoting other publications. And that is my rule. If they haven't been named, uh, I won't be naming them. But if they have been named already in reputable uh, journalistic sources, then I will name them. No problems at all. But I can't have a legal case. So I'm not pushing anything. It's out, not out there already. And probably we all have probably heard. So this is the case, unfortunately, for the next example I have. I can only reference the article. It was published in French quite a few years ago. Well, not quite a few, about four or five years ago, I think. It was in the OBS or the Nouvel Observateur. Um, I'm going to put the link in the description. So it's in French. You can just hit Google Translate. There is a paywall after a certain amount. But if you Google the title as well, you will find other quotes from the article. I paid for the paywall to get the article. But here's the gist of the article. So it's a student called Léa, that's not her real name, who was 16 and attended the École Normale de Musique de Paris, which was my old school, in 2012. Now, in her first flute lesson, the flute teacher at the École put his hand up her shirt. She then goes on to say he would drive her home and force her to perform oral sex acts in the car, physically force her. She then goes on to say that it was known with other students that being told to go under the piano was a sign that something bad was about to happen. Now, I knew these rumours. We all heard these rumours in France. And I know exactly who this is. And if you ask anyone in France or any French flute player, we all know who it is. But for some fucking reason, we can't say it. And it's not a secret at all. I heard them when I first arrived at the École Normale because some of his former students were in my class. My teacher actually took over his class. So I was at a party once as well when I just arrived in Paris and someone we were I met someone in a party it wasn't a musician's party it was a normal person party and I met this girl who was chatting away and she's like oh I'm a flute player and I was like oh really and where do you study and blah 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 who do you study with and she mentioned this teacher's name and said she studied with him for a little while and she instantly went very handsy touched me quite a few times I had to get away from him but so casually and that's the first time I heard about it anytime after that you mentioned this guy's name that is exactly what followed so I'll tell you what other details they give in the article and that's it. So they did say he was an école normale teacher. He was a former teacher at the CNSM or the Paris Conservatoire as you may know at the CNSM de Paris. Inter in, yeah, internationally recognizable and very influential in the flute world. So I'll let you guys put two and two together on that one. Um, if you get past the paywall it does cover his involvement in youth orchestras and a couple of students stories of tales to China on a youth orchestra tour. I will give you a big warning on that. Please be careful before you go reading that article. It is very difficult to read. Even researching it for this podcast. I did this episode. I researched and wrote this episode maybe four weeks ago and it's just taken me this long to actually get the strength to record it. That's why I'm sort of tripping over my words a lot in this episode. I've forgotten it. I've forgotten a lot of what I've written down and also it's just really difficult. I'm being very careful about what I say. It's it's a very tough topic to cover. And it's very dark and reading that article is one of the reasons why it's so dark. So please be careful if you're going in there. If you're of if you're not in great headspace, I wouldn't go near that article, okay? Or wait till you are. But even with this, all this evidence, years of everybody knowing, they don't publish his name. They can't. I don't know why, to be totally honest. But if you've been if you've been to a conservatoire or you've worked in an orchestra or you've been involved in this high end level of classical music you've heard similar rumors every college has one every orchestra has one everyone this is actually why this episode was getting written i've met up with a lot of flute players recently and now as this podcast grows a bit you get a lot of people coming up to you and saying things like oh you should get this person on and you should get that person on i'll speak to them they would love to do it and you know i have to go around i have to turn around and say well no i'll be cold in the fucking ground before that person gets near my podcast um because i know i know what the rumors are about them there's a lot of people and i swear to god nearly every fucking flute player i chat to not on the podcast but i mean in life over the last 10 years every flute player i've chatted to either has experienced some kind of abuse or knows someone who has pretty much every fucking classical musician every mind flute player it's wild and I've had so many of these conversations, especially in the last few months, you wouldn't believe it. And yeah, I just had to make this episode for it. So here, we've done the awareness. That bit's done. Let's get on to something a little bit more positive. We're going to talk about the potential antidote to toxic masculinity, hopefully then leading to a reducing sexual abuse. But yeah. So also on a happy note, I'm drinking a beautiful beer. Not beer, sorry. Spetsy. 
I've probably talked about it in this podcast before, but this is the Powlander version. It's Fanta Orange and Coca-Cola mixed together, but this is like their own cola and their own Fanta mixed together. It is fucking delicious. Even look at the bottle. It's gorgeous. V9G logo is based on this, if I haven't said this before. So if you Google Spezi, S-P-E-Z-I, for the audio listeners, you can find the logo. It's so cool. Anyway, sorry, that's just a... Just because it was so delicious. So, the antidote to toxic masculinity. Firstly, I will say, if you've ever suffered or witnessed any form of abuse in the music world, here are some resources. Now, I only know the UK-based ones, but if you want help finding something local to you, I'm really happy to suggest some others. So, please seek these people's help, these person's help. They're experts and they know how to help you. They do incredible work, absolutely fair fucks to them. They're going to be, they're great. I've worked personally with a lot of people in these industries and these uh, corporations and businesses etc etc and charities so i know how good they are so you really can trust them and you can use them so if you're based in the uk helpmusicians.org.uk helpmusicians.org.uk sorry um it's a great place to start they've got loads of resources on their website there's different parts of it you can click in to see what type of abuse or what you want to report or what you want to talk about or what kind of support you're looking for if you're studying certainly in the uk you will have a local musicians union based or a conservatory sorry not a musicians union a student's union so your students union will be there they will be trained for this and ready for this i'm aware of how much training the uk conservatoires have got in this at the recent qcast conventions so they are prepared to have these stories and they're trained to deal with them so you can reach out to your students union if you're in the uk for the rest of the world i'm not sure but i imagine so um your local musicians union so there's a couple in the uk um, for example the incorporated society of musicians the ism they have loads of resources excuse me on their website so i would go and check them out for sure um if you're in any other part of the world and you want specific resources you can message me directly and i will ask people i know in those parts of the world to see who they can recommend as a charity or a place to go and talk to now for other solutions firstly this is an extremely complex issue so i'm not going to pretend i have the answer at all but what i do have are some quotes from an excellent paper called gendered bodies and power dynamics the relationship between toxic masculinity and sexual harassment so first quote considering the insecurities and fragility of the individuals who perpetrate this behavior it is crucial for the benefit of everyone involved that we do not vilify and alienate these men we should try to use our current knowledge as a way of decreasing stigma and getting to the root of the issue rather than continuing to focus solely on the symptoms or results of their behavior give that title a google it's a brilliant read it's all free it's on the internet um so here's the practical solutions to that now firstly these solutions are mainly for the lads for the boys for the fellas amongst you and the reason i'm saying that is because in my opinion this is a male issue females are the victims the vast majority of the victims are female however lads are the issue so it's up it's up to us to sort this out so i've got three wee solutions for these lads okay so number one go and have a chat with the women in your life and get some context genuinely um so your mum your sister your girlfriend your auntie your granny go find the nearest woman in your life the closest woman to you i mean emotionally close i don't mean go grab on a woman in the street um i did this after the abortion referendum in ireland so ireland had an abortion referendum in, i think it was 2016 where it was just going to a yes no vote should be legalized abortion now in the north of ireland i have to say where i was we didn't get the vote but the conversation was happening a lot up there because we had similar laws um and i heard a bit of advice once of from a guy called blind boy the blind boy podcast he's a podcaster in ireland where he said if you're a lad you're not really voting for you here abortion is a women's issue so you have a vote go and ask the nearest woman in your life what she's voting and why and just do it for her when i started having those conversations with my mother especially for example i was amazed at what i found out what how difficult the female experience can be and we're just totally oblivious to it and lads, i'm not ashamed to say i was fucking 24 when i had that conversation until that age i was so ignorant blissfully ignorant of what women went through i just didn't talk about it it just never even occurred to me to ask women have you suffered from this so when you go and have those conversations it can give you a lot of context and it's healthy and it's good for you it's difficult conversations but it's it's really good even they don't have to be difficult sometimes small anecdotes can really change your thinking just let you realize that women go through a different experience the vast majority of the time to what we do as lads now the second solution if you're a teacher or you're a flutist in an orchestra or you're in some kind of way uh, in a professional position of power, treat the girls the same. 
So all I mean is, if a lad came into the orchestra, for example, and you would ask him to go watch the match, go ask a girl too. Go ask the new girl. Don't just wait for the lad to ask him if he fancies going to the football. Maybe the girl will fancy it. Or if you're going to ask the lad for a pint after work, go ask the girl. Don't assume girls aren't interested. Involve them in the same group. Whatever you would do to a lad, treat the girl the same way. Now, when I say, like, I love a lad's night out. I really love that. But when I say I love a lad's night out, there's often girls on him. By lad's night out, I mean I just kind of want to talk about football. Maybe talk a little bit about kung fu after a couple of pints. Sometimes I do like to go through the entire discography of Thin Lizzy and talk about Gary Moore guitar solos. These are the kind of things we do in a lad's night out. And there's many women, many wee girls that come along and contribute to that crack. So it's brilliant. When a lad's night out, I don't mean that. So don't isolate women or treat them differently. And especially before you actually get to know what their interests are. By the way, on the note of football, I keep bringing up football in this podcast episode. On the note of football, I've had one podcast guest, one who actually was interested in football. I've talked about football with many of them. There's one guest so far that's actually interested in football, and it was a girl. So there you fucking go. And when I say football, by the way, I mean real football. You know, when say ask your colleagues to go out and watch the match, I mean a football match. Don't ask them to do American football. For fuck's sake, that's a stupid sport. Go ask them to do a proper match okay number three if you see sexist behavior challenge it now i'm going to be careful the way i word this i don't mean go and shout at people that show sexist behavior or have a pop at them or swing for them i mean have a chat because that's where the solutions will really come in the long term if you fight them or you shout at them you're just going to get you're going to get the same thing back so you're just going to piss them off they're going to get angry and it's going to reinforce their behavior and their beliefs so don't do that it doesn't work The real root of the problem is going to get solved from us lads by talking to each other properly. So, for example, if you see someone doing sexy behaviour, go up and ask them why they feel that way. Ask them, oh, well, what makes you think that? What makes you feel that? Why do you feel like that? 90% of the time, they're not sure how they feel or they can't label their emotions, more importantly. So they resort to anger. It's like the default in toxic masculinity. When you can't work anything else out, you go to anger. You know, for example, a classic one is when a guy comes up to you and says, oh yeah, the girl there, she rejected me, she's a bitch. And instead of going, yeah, she's a bitch, fuck her, what about saying, well, why do you think she rejected you? And maybe say, like, are you worried there's something wrong with you or something fundamentally wrong with you? Sometimes having these chats open up everything. So get past the anger and let them know that other emotions are okay to express and have a wee chat with them. And you'll do that on a daily basis. It's something that we can change. I truly believe one of the solutions to this problem is going to be young lads, even as young as fucking eight years old, but in their football clubs where it's all other boys and their coaches are going to have these conversations with them and the other lads are going to talk to each other and we're going to grow up being able to express emotion. And don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect, lads. When I was younger, I was in those groups of the lads. You know, the things that Donald Trump calls locker talk, I don't know what the Irish equivalent word of it is, but I've had those groups. You know, when I was 14, I wouldn't have dreamed of turning around to my mates and saying, oh, I've met a girl. She's funny. She makes me laugh. I really like her. I wouldn't have fucking dreamed of it because ironically, they probably would have called me gay. But not even thinking of it. Oh, if it said, oh yeah, she's hot. She's got big boobs. Yeah, that would be grand. But I wouldn't have dreamed of saying, I really like her. I I like the way I feel around her. I would have got dogs abuse from it. So I've been there, I know exactly what it's like, and I wish those problems were sorted out back then, and I wish I had a healthier group, but every fucking lad I know had the same thing in Ireland. We suffered from it. Locker talk, as that fucking cunt Trump said. Sorry, I shouldn't have sworn. But anyway, listen guys, we're done for now. Okay, that's how long I've been going here. That's 33 minutes. That's a nice wee small episode of the bite size for the for this podcast, and just to touch on the subject a little bit. So that was a bit of a ride. I'm exhausted after that, but let's end on a bit of a happy note i've had the pleasure and i mean the absolute fucking pleasure of interviewing some of my favorite flute players in the world recently and they have all been sweethearts genuinely the the flute community is by large a supportive and just downright cool place so i don't want to shit on the flute community and make it sound like there's loads of abusers and stuff out there might be but from my experience recently there is some beautiful souls in there. I've, I've loved this. I really have loved doing this podcast and getting to know you guys and getting to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. So it's not going to be the last time I cover this topic, but I wanted to get this off my chest. So thank you for listening. If you have any thoughts on it, throw them my way. 
Um, if you think I should do another episode on this, or I should propose another episode, or present it in another another form, I don't know. I'm not really sure what to do with this topic at the minute. But I'm going to do my best to be of some kind of help. But I got it off my chest anyway. So lads, listen, go and have a lovely weekend. Look after yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. Be compassionate. And go, lads, go have a wee chat with your ma or your sister. Right, I love you loads. Have a great weekend. Smooches. Thank you.